And hold your Bible up real high as we say this. But be very careful that you think about these uh, words that we say about this, which is the greatest gift that God has given to us uh, in this world. Uh, it is the only source of absolute truth that there is in this world, and we have it available to us every day. Here we go. This is the Bible. It is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired it. Jesus authenticated it. God has protected it. This book is God's light for the pathways of my life. The Bible is like no other book in the world. It is the truth of God to change me and to mold me into the person that God wants me to be. Now as I study God's Word, I will open my heart, my mind, and my will to God and to the authority of this sacred book. I invite the Holy Spirit to speak to me through His Word, which is living and powerful. Uh, I have to say, I absolutely love to listen to uh, to the passion with which you say that affirmation. I am so very grateful to Yahweh, and I do thank him on a very, very regular basis, probably daily, uh, that I can be part of a church like this that believes the words of that affirmation uh, and wants to live it out in our church life and in our home lives. Well, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. Verse 23, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Um, and now, to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold to, toward you, but I beg you that when I am present, I may, not, I may not be bold with the confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as, as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war, against, war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments with every high thing that exalts itself, against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as Pastor Terry approaches the podium now, we just ask that you be with him, that the Holy Spirit can work through him, and uh, be with his preparation, that all of he's prepared now comes out on, on to, through his mouth to our ears, um, through the scripture, that truth be the only thing that's expounded here this morning, and Lord, that, that we understand these truths. Lord, deepen our understanding of these passages, know that where we're at today, we could not travel on tomorrow without knowing these truths. Let it be that important. Lord, we just ask that you be with us, we be, be with this church, we be with Pastor Terry as we go through the rest of this Sunday morning. We pray this in your power, in your name, amen. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you so much, Chris. Nick, Pastor John, thank you very much for your leadership in the early part of this service. <clears throat> always, always a blessing. And we also had a really incredible time in our adult Sunday school class this morning. That was, uh, that was a very, very... Uh, stimulating, encouraging, refreshing time 
studying Yahweh's Word together there as well. Hopefully you have a copy of the sermon outline in front of you uh, from, it's in the bulletin of course, as always, and I'm, uh, I'm going to do something very different this morning. I'm uh, going to break every rule of conventional teaching about preaching. <laughs> uh, you know, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to give an introduction to a sermon. Uh, it, the introduction is supposed to uh, have some kind of catchy uh, story or way of catching your attention uh, and uh, taking you out of whatever state your mind is in to, to orient you to the subject of the message and so on. Uh, supposedly powerful stories are part of introductions and all of that. I'm going to break all of those rules and we're going straight to the passage. Okay? Will you go with me? I don't have to play all those games with you, huh? All right. So I want to call your attention to the sermon outline sheet. Uh, I want to remind you, I've said it many, many times as we've come through the many, 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 many sermons we have preached on <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2. <laughs> uh, and we will get to chapter 3 next week, Lord willing, Yahweh willing, we will get there, Chris. All right. He is just a delightful guy, isn't he? Isn't he a fun character? Uh, anyway, uh, there are 11 imperatives. There are 11 direct commands from Yahweh himself uh, that are given to us in 2 Timothy 1 chapter, chapter 2. Um, the outline doesn't exactly represent all 11 of those. For example, the the first point on the outline actually includes two of the imperatives, uh, and a couple of them later on don't reflect being a, another imperative, but uh, the outline does represent the flow of the passage, and, and I think that's uh, important for the outline. But I also have to admit, prior to teaching and preaching my way through the second chapter of the book of 2 Timothy, I have never realized what an incredible chapter it is. I have to say, as I was, as I was uh, reviewing uh, this chapter in preparation for this morning, I have to say uh, that title, Powerful Practical Instruction for the Servants of Yahweh, uh, is a very good title. And uh, this is really, really, really a powerful chapter, and I really encourage you to spend some time reading it, processing it, studying it, uh, meditating on it. Now, some of you think you know. I'll bet you there's somebody out there who thinks they know what I'm going to say next. I know my son does, sitting in the back. <laughs> you think I'm going to say, well, let's review this chapter, don't you? That's what you think I'm going to say. And I'd love to do that. <laughs> I'd love to spend time reviewing this chapter. Uh, but in order to do uh, what I consider to be a, like an adequate job of covering these last four verses of this second chapter, which are packed, jam-packed with truth, I'm going to encourage, encourage you to just review this, uh, this chapter on your own. Uh, and perhaps some of you have already done that in preparation for this morning, but uh, it, it's a formidable study. Uh, chapter 2 uh, is something you will profit from the more time you spend there. Okay, so verses 23 through 26 is no exception. Uh, they too are, these verses include powerful, practical truths or instructions for the servants of Yahweh. So the first part of verse 23, focus on that for a moment, would you please, with me? But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. 
knowing that they generate strife. So Paul uses a, a, a pretty common word here to refer to, uh, that's translated disputes. Uh, it's uh, basically a, the word for debate, uh, honest search for truth. Um, but when he adds the, the two ideas of foolishness and ignorance in front of it, he's obviously not talking about uh, a discussion like we had in our adult Sunday school class this morning uh, about doctrine and about truths of doctrine. Uh, he's not talking about debating uh, doctrine or refuting false teaching. Those kinds of debates or controversies are not only good and important, but they're necessary for the church to have. You, we need to have doctrinal discussions. We need to protect and provide sound doctrine and scriptural teachings. Uh, that's what our guest conference coming up, uh, scheduled for this summer, is going to do, especially with regard to free grace theology and those other things that don't teach free grace theology. Now, what Paul is talking about here in verse 23 is those foolish, ungodly things that get promoted by foolish and ungodly people. Um, I'm going to give two examples of it this morning that I think are very prominent, very prevalent today, and that, that do uh, engage a lot of Christians in a lot of controversy and dispute and strife that is uh, totally unnecessary and shouldn't be done. <clears throat> one, of course, is man-made climate change, okay? That's one of those foolish and ignorant disputes. Uh, it's very relevant. Um, it's actually supposed to get above zero today. It already is. Well, praise Yahweh. <laughs> Heat wave, right? Climate change. <laughs> Uh, year to year, there's climate change. Ten-year cycles, there's climate change. Twenty-year cycles, there's climate change. Uh, who knows what the weather is going to be exactly? Not even the weather people know. Nobody knows because climate change and weather change uh, is something that is absolutely a part of life. But none of it is man-made, and that's the key. Um, then again, uh, it has been a much better winter, hasn't it, than last winter. I'm really glad that we, uh, we are this far along in the winter and we don't have much snow like we did last year. Now, we know, folks, don't we? We know that the data was made up uh, for climate change. We know that the models were specifically designed to get the results that were desired by Corrupt and ungodly people, uh, corrupt and ungodly people made the whole thing up, uh, and they have truly succeeded in duping and deceiving hundreds of millions of people around the world. Uh, we must eliminate carbon dioxide production from our lives, we are told. Uh, if we don't quit using coal and fossil fuels to provide electricity, we're going to destroy the earth, we are told. Now foolish people in very high places, Congress, uh, in the administration in Washington, D.C., actually argue and tell us that we have less than 10 years to stop using fossil fuels and, or humanity is going to be wiped off the face of the earth by man-made climate change. They've been telling us that for, what is it, five or six decades? <laughs> or three or four decades, I don't know how many times 10 years has been, has been the number and we've passed it and nothing has happened. But it, it's foolish, folks. It's foolishness, it's biblically ignorance. Biblical ignorance, uh, we are not going to... Uh, to take over God, Yahweh's role in controlling the climate of the earth. Uh, and this passage commands us to avoid getting into those kinds of arguments. They're just strife generating 
uh, satanic playground stuff. And uh, we shouldn't get involved. The second event example I want to use uh, of what kind of thing Paul, I think, is probably talking about here for our day would be that whole COVID virus response thing. Uh, it was only a few years ago now, I mean, very short time ago, uh, that we were being told by Dr. Fauci and all of the powers that be in the CDC that we needed to lock down our lives, we needed to separate from everyone else around us, we needed to wear masks, we needed to stay away from everybody, at least six feet uh, away from everybody. Uh, when the COVID vaccines came out, we were told, we were ordered to get it. We were told that if we have any kind of sense and any kind of concern for the well-being of humanity, we must get the vaccine. Now we are finding out that is, there are very grave questions regarding it. Uh, we were also told that the church must shut down. Churches must quit meeting together. Churches have to stop gathering together. Many did. Some didn't. Truth Fellowship was among the some that didn't. Uh, I th we missed a few Sundays of meeting here. I think it was only two that we didn't meet. Uh, there were several weeks that we met in the field behind our house. Remember that? Uh, we stayed in our cars. We did uh, not forsake the assembling of ourselves uh, together, uh, but, uh, but then that only lasted for a few weeks, and then we started meeting again here. What we didn't do was engage in any disputes uh, or controversies with people over our response to COVID. Uh, we just started meeting together again uh, as per the instructions of the Word of Yahweh. Uh, we let people decide whether they wanted to come or not, whether they wanted to wear masks or not. Some in our church family became very upset with us for the way we handled it. Uh, some left our church over it. Some of us were very, very sad to see those who left go. We loved them. We cared about them. But we did not engage in open disputes and quarrels with them over our disagreements about COVID. We now know that Dr. Fauci was lying. He wasn't just mistaken, he was lying in what we call, what he was calling the science of it all. Uh, that was nothing more than his own imaginations and speculations. Uh, when he was put under oath and when he was forced to tell the truth, uh, he told a very, very different story. He's been testifying in Congress just recently. And he testified in Congress that the six-foot rule and the math mandate, mask mandates were not science at all. In fact, he had no idea how that, those two things got started, uh, but he just made it up that, they were, that there was any science behind it. And that he has actually testified to under oath. There you have it, folks. These words written nearly 2,000 years ago in a huge hole in the ground in Rome, Italy by the Apostle Paul. Powerful, practical instructions for the servants of Yahweh that are as relevant <laughs> as they could possibly be today. Avoid foolish, ignorant disputes. Now Paul follows this up with verses 24 and 25. He says in verses 24 and 25, And the servant of Yahweh must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. So these two verses uh, clarify how a godly Christian interacts with and responds to people 
who are in opposition to the truth. Now, I want you to note this, uh, this phrase, opposition to the truth, is a very carefully crafted one. It does not mean confirmed, full-blown false teacher. It does not mean that. Opposition to the truth is something less than confirmed false teaching. Uh, and uh, there are people who, uh, these are people who are clearly in earlier stages of error. Uh, they are already in error, but they're, they're not uh, in false teaching stage. And how do, I, how do I say that? How do I know that? Well, this is where context Context, context helps us know what is being said. So opposition to the truth and, and uh, helping to correct those people, uh, there are five components that the Apostle Paul gives us uh, to this important, precise instruction from our Father in Heaven about dealing with those kinds of people. First of all, don't quarrel with them. Don't get into quarrels. This is the word uh, for intense struggles. It really is the word for intense struggles. It's used three other times in the New Testament. Every time it clearly involves some sort of fighting, literally fighting. Uh, it's either a verbal fight uh, that's pretty intense or even physical fights. So uh, the warning is to the servants of Yahweh, you and I, who want to serve Yahweh, not to get involved in high tension, high emotional conflicts with other Christians. The second thing is uh, we're instructed to be gentle. Uh, this is an important word. Uh, you remember when we were going through the fruits of the Spirit, we, we came across the word translated gentle, but it didn't mean gentle at all. It meant something uh, quite different from gentle. But here it does mean gentle. Uh, it's used one other time, this particular word translated gentle, is used only one other time in the New Testament, and that's in 1 Thessalonians where Paul talks about uh, a nursing mother and the way she uh, relates to her little baby child uh, and with gentleness. So this is gentle. This is, this is our English word for gentle uh, in the Greek language. So we're not to quarrel, we're, we're to be gentle. Verse, uh, the third thing uh, is that we always have to be ready and able to teach someone the truth of the Scriptures. Able to teach. Folks, you cannot possibly overstate the importance of being a Christian who knows and understands the Scriptures, who is well-versed in the Scriptures, who is always ready to bring the truth to life in our conversations and in our relationships with other people, especially those who are uh, opposing aspects of sound doctrine and truth. The fourth thing is to be patient. <laughs> uh, this one really speaks to my heart. <laughs> uh, I, I, I am not naturally a patient person, all right? It's just not who I am naturally. And some people are easy to be patient with. Some people, you know, as a pastor, I have no trouble uh, being patient with them. Some people, patience is tough. Right? <laughs> it is. Some people are snarky. Uh, some people are mean spirited. Uh, they make it hard uh, to show grace and patience with them. This passage says it is very, very important that we try. That we be gentle and patient with people. Uh, the fifth thing that is said here is the beginning of an explanation as to why. Why do we need to be patient and gentle with people and not get into quarrels with them? It's because we are in humility, supposed to be uh, doing this with a view to correcting those who are in opposition to the truth. And uh, in order to do that, we have to be able to uh, treat them with uh, patience and gentleness 
in humility. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to wake you up, I suspect. Let's pretend for just a moment that Barack Obama and Bill and Hillary Clinton walk through that door into this room. All right? This passage tells me that I must be patient and gentle and ready and willing in humility to try to correct people and to teach them the truth. Um, I would find that very difficult with those three people that I mentioned. And they may not be a very good example because maybe they are already confirmed false teachers. I don't know for sure, but for the sake of example, let me continue, okay, with, with how I started this. So I have zero respect for any one of those three people. I have zero admiration for any one of them. Uh, and I have very little confidence that any one of them would have any interest in the truth that I would want to share with them. However, in this passage, Yahweh tells me that I should treat them uh, as people that are caught up in lies and who need to come to their senses and who need the truth. And I should treat them with the same gentleness and with the same patience and with the same humility as I would perhaps uh, offer to someone like, let's say, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu walk through that door. Someone for whom I have a great deal of admiration and respect. But also someone who is in opposition to the truth. Maybe a, even more opposition to very, very important truths than people like the Clintons or Obama. Interesting, huh? Uh, I, I, <laughs> I sat in my chair yesterday th thinking about whether I was going to actually use this as an illustration. I, I think it's, it's helpful. Um, whether, whether we think they're, these people are going to be responsive or not is not the, is not the point. Uh, we are responsible. This passage teaches us. We are responsible to treat others who are in opposition to the truth uh, with patience and gentleness and with a deep heart's desire to help them come to know and embrace the truth. Now, the last part of verse 25 and verse 26 brings all of this to an important conclusion. And here's what Yahweh says. He says, if Yahweh perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Oh, my, 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 my. Isn't that an interesting, uh, powerful statement? Uh, because there you have it, folks. There you have Yahweh's perspective on people. This is how he thinks about people. Even the most difficult, sometimes arrogant, maybe snarky, cranky people. Somehow, we are called upon by Yahweh himself to see them as he apparently sees them. He apparently sees them as people who desperately need to come to their senses. They're literally out of their mind. And they need the truth. And we are called upon as his servants to be his servants, to represent him well in doing his work in this dangerous, messed up world where people are truly taken captive and ensnared by Satan and his lies. He wants us to represent him well. And we do that by treating people who are in opposition to the truth with patience and gentleness. We must see them through the eyes of our Heavenly Father 
who sees them as literally not in their right minds, needing to come to their senses, needing a dose of reality. And then there's that odd phrase. You notice that odd phrase in verse 25? Did you notice it as we read through? If God perhaps will grant them repentance. That stick out to any of you? It sure did to me. We have to discuss this. We have to talk about it because it implies that there are occasions when Yahweh does not grant people repentance, right? Doesn't it imply that? You bet it does. I looked at the Greek text and I looked at all the different major translations and Everybody basically translated it exactly the same, and it's a good translation. I think the New King James did a great job of translating that uh, phrase. Uh, and it certainly implies the way it's worded, and that in the Greek text as well, that there may be occasions when Yahweh does not grant repentance. Now, I must say, I'm kind of all alone standing here <laughs> in my saying that. I checked a lot of commentaries. I mean, I spent a long time checking a lot of commentaries uh, on this phrase, and not one, not one admitted that this passage actually indicates that perhaps Yahweh will not grant repentance to people. They talk all around it. Um, many never actually comment on the phrase at all. <laughs> uh, or they flat out say, God never hesitates to grant repentance, which is, I think, exactly the opposite of what this passage implies, infers. Um, it says he may, or that he may not. That's what the passage says. Um, and I think that's very consistent with the rest of Scripture. Uh, there are obviously times when people have gone too far. There are obviously times uh, when people will not be granted another opportunity for repentance. Their time is up. There came a time when Yahweh closed the door to the ark, right? He closed the door to the ark. And all that were outside the ark perished. Um, there was a time when some of the Corinthians, in fact, many of them, actually died. Their time was up. They had no more opportunities to repent of their abuse of the Lord's table. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that they actually, many actually died because they had gone too far and they had gone on too long and Yahweh determined that the time is up only he knows when that time is, but this passage makes it clear that we do not know <laughs> when that time is. And Yahweh has made that determination that we should teach or treat people as if it was always still possible from our perspective that we can uh, help them, lead them, encourage them toward repentance and that God will grant it. Uh, you have to say in balance uh, with this passage, though, that it's very, very clear that uh, Paul did confirm, finally, some people as false teachers. Um, so, when we are patient and gentle with people who are not yet confirmed false teachers, we are doing what this passage directs us to do. Finally, verse 26 adds another whole dimension to this discussion that is very, very important for us to realize and, and talk about. Verse 26 describes these people like perhaps the Obamas and the Clintons of this world who are caught in the snare of the devil. They have believed Satan's lies. 
They are doing Satan's will. They are not doing Yahweh's will. Yahweh wants his servants to be ready and to be willing to try to help those people who are caught in Satan's web of lies. <sighs> Folks, I just have to say this. This is so important. If people have not been consistently under the solid teaching of the word of Yahweh, it is very likely, very likely, and getting more so every single day in this bizarre world, that they will have and will be embracing many and many more lies of the enemy. Even Christians who attend churches where there's no solid and consistent teaching of the Scriptures, where the Scriptures are rightly divided for them time and time and time again, week after week after week, yes, even Christians can be deeply ensnared by the devil's lies. It is the absolute truth of the word of Yahweh, carefully, consistently, exposited, taught, preached, that frees people up from Satan's lies. I still believe that sometimes Christians need a special time of breaking free from the bondage of the devil. I have uh, encouraged for many, many years Christians who are struggling, really struggling, to consider going through the seven steps to freedom. Neil Anderson's seven steps, it's well done. It's one of the best resources I've ever found uh, that's available now. It's a, it's a mega dose of scriptural truth, uh, and it gives opportunity to formally renounce specific Lies of the devil, some of the most commonly believed lies that Satan ensnares us in. So uh, if, you, uh, if you are struggling or if you know someone who is, uh, we, we do still here. I know Pastor John or myself would be willing to, uh, to lead you through uh, a seven steps to freedom. It's quite a commitment on both your, the person's part as well as on our part. So, uh, you know, we don't just do it lightly, but, but it is an important possible way of helping people break free from the snare that Satan, uh, Satan's lies have, have them captured in. That's why I have had asked Chris to read that 2 Corinthians 10 passage because... That is a very, very clear passage on the process of uh, being set free from Satan's lies that, uh, and, being, and taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. All right, timeless truth. I wrote this timeless truth. The word of Yahweh is filled with powerful practical instructions on how to live our lives here on earth during these last days of the last days. In order for the church to function properly, Yahweh's servants, that is Christians who want to serve Yahweh, must avoid highly charged, foolish, and ignorant debates and disputes. Instead, we must view people who are in opposition through Yahweh's eyes as being people in need of the truth. They are in Satan's snare of lies. They need to come to their senses. They need to embrace the truth rather than the lies. The servants of Yahweh can help them do that by being patient and gentle with them, by teaching them the truth and correcting their errors in their thinking and beliefs. And then here's the timeless truth that I wrote. Oftentimes people approach us in a very blustery and even snarky manner. They can be they may be angry and critical. They may even be, they may even be a, a bit combative and mean-spirited. It's important to always remember that Yahweh wants us to be as gentle and as patient as possible with everyone. We must remember that we may be one of Yahweh's tools to help that person come to repentance 
and to their senses. Perhaps we can be part of their being freed up from Satan's snare. What a privilege, right? What a privilege to be one of Yahweh's servants. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your love for us and your love for people, even those who are in opposition. We know that you are incredibly patient, merciful, kind, gentle, good, gracious. And we know that you're the, the perfect Father. We pray that you would help us to be uh, good servants of yours, good and faithful servants who, who honor you, who believe and teach and, and practice your word, who, uh, who represent you well in the church and outside the church and the community. Help us, Father, to be the kind of men and women who bring you honor, praise, glory, and pleasure. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Did everybody get thawed out? <laughs> if you came to the church last week, you know our pipes had frozen and we got that thawed out, but that's all taken care of. So, welcome this morning. We're very glad to see you. Uh, <clears throat> I'd never heard that song before, but uh, to think there, there's somebody that rescued me, and that somebody is Jesus. Wow. And uh, if you've believed in him for eternal life, you have been rescued. And we look forward to that day when he comes to gather up his church. And what a day that'll be. Uh, that'll really, really be something. Uh, thanks so much for supporting our ministry. Uh, as you may or may not know, we don't pass a plate here. So uh, if you want to donate to our ministry, just drop your gifts in the black box on the back wall. And we will take care of it. Uh, do so prayerfully because giving is an act of worship. And... Uh, Make sure that you present your gifts as that act of worship. Uh, kind of an add-on uh, to the announcements, there will be a safety meeting tomorrow night at 7. So if you're on the safety team or considering joining the safety team, uh, please come over at 7 uh, for that meeting. <clears throat> Tuesday is our prayer time at 6 p.m. Uh, send your requests to prayer at truthfellowshiplive.com or text them. Uh, to myself or Mark or somebody, and, and we'll make sure we get them and we, we'll, we'll pray for them. Um, try to do it before 6, so I, I see it. Uh, I do get buzzed if you text me and, and I can share them with a the group at that point, but it does work a lot better if you get them to me before 6 on, on Tuesday. Uh, giving statements, uh, they were mailed out this week. And I don't know, has anybody gotten one in the mail? Quite a few of you. Make sure that you kind of look at your mailbox. Uh, check that giving statement against your records. We've got new software this year. And so um, I, I checked on mine to see if it was right. It, it was. But uh, I don't know about everybody else's. So do look at that giving report. And if there's a problem, please see me quickly so we can get that fixed and and uh, set up properly. Um, I am also te thinking about teaching a, a course on understanding the Bible. I've been asked uh, if we could offer that. And uh, so I'm, I'm thinking about it, and I'm willing to do that. And if you're interested in a class, it'd be basic Bible study, understanding your Bible. We'd show you methods and actually do some practice and those sorts of things. So uh, if you're interested in that, see me um, so we can know if, if there's enough people to, to actually go ahead and do that. And uh, again, uh, I, I'd be willing to do that. And I, I think it would probably be Thursday nights. So um, if that works into your schedule, let me know. Uh, women's Bible study uh, got off to a start last week with a coffee and... and uh, so this week, uh, I, I understand that the video is not available, so they'll be winging it. Is that what you're going to do? Kind of wing it? Yeah, because of the weather, they pulled it And they're in like Tennessee or something? Really miserable weather down there. I, I heard it, it, it got down to like 25 degrees. 
And I'll tell you, that really shuts them down. <laughs> and if they got a little rain with it, then that's all ice. And the ice in the south is terrible. So, so it didn't happen. They, they didn't get their video made. So um, you're going to do something tomorrow. So the women will meet uh, at the uh, 10.30 time and the 7 p.m. time. So 6.30? 6.30 p.m. time. I got that wrong. So 6.30 for the, for the evening session, 10.30 a.m. for the morning session. Volunteer schedules are on the back table. I printed some more up. Um, you know, that's for February, March. So the next time we, we do schedules, it'll be spring. So winter's just gone. <laughs> right? Winter's gone. We canceled it. We, we just cancel it. <laughs> so... Uh, look at the schedules. If you have a problem, please uh, find a substitute and mark it on the copy that's on the bulletin board in, in the hallway. Uh, you can look at your bulletin for other details. Uh, <clears throat> Psalm 119, 171, 172 says, My lips shall, not, shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteous. And that's, that's what we stand behind here, that God's word is what's important. So uh, speak it, praise him, utter praise to him, teach his statutes, and, and uh, speak of his word. And that's, that's what it's all about. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so thankful that you have given us your word, that you... Um, Allow us a little peek, a little glimpse of seeing who you are and understanding uh, what it is that you expect from us. And, and Lord, uh, we are so, so blessed to, to, to be able to study and to understand your word. Lord, now help us to keep our focus fully on you as we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor that you so right, rightly deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.